Okay, uh, my name is Devashish Paul. I'm uh, founder and CEO of Blue Wave AI. I'd like to thank all the audience who joined us today. We're kicking off another one of our summits. We've been doing these virtually uh, through the pandemic, going back to May of 2020, collecting leaders from around the world on key energy transition topics. And uh, today the focus is on EVs, both personal EV and fleet EVs, and how they will impact the grid and how data and AI can be used to more effectively manage that. So we got a great lineup of, uh, of panelists today. Let me just touch, before we go into the panelists, let's just touch on the, the, the general ch challenges. So the, the problem is the grid has capacity. That capacity is finite, it's not infinite. And a lot of the energy that we used to get from gas stations is gonna move in to being delivered through the poles and wires of the grid, both to our own vehicles, as many of us adopt EVs, and to electric buses and last mile delivery vehicles and taxis and maintenance vehicles and so on. So that actually ends up becoming a challenge that these panelists who are leaders in the industry uh, are at the forefront of. Many of us don't see the challenges they have. So we got this all-star lineup of really smart people dealing with this stuff who will share with you some of the challenges of moving all of this energy uh, you know, from the legacy oil producer, so to speak, uh, over the grid, ideally using more renewable energy and so forth. So the fleets now are a point load. In other words, there's a depot, a bus depot, or you know, a, a delivery depot, like a FedEx depot or a UPS depot. They're in one location and the utility operator can work with those. On the flip side, residential EVs, private cars, they're just all over the place and no one gets to decide what happens with that. So these are some of the challenges that, the, that exist in the industry to onboard this. We'll also talk about how data can be used better to basically avoid major upgrades. So I'd like to give a, before we introduce our keynote speaker, I'd like to thank our sponsors. So Invest Ottawa, organization here in Ottawa, Canada, driving innovation in terms of technology, new businesses, startups, and taking that to the commercial market worldwide. So Invest Ottawa is a key enabler of the startup ecosystem in Ottawa, Canada. And of course, my company, Blue Wave AI, who are the hosts. Blue Wave AI is a company focused on using AI and data-driven techniques to onboard more renewable energy, more EVs, and make the grid smarter. Our goal, and we're on the path, is to make the world's most strong company in transport electrification and renewable energy, leveraging AI and help transform how the world uses energy. We are on the ground floor of great movement. So with that, I'm gonna introduce Catherine McKenna. Catherine is principal and founder of Climate and Nature Solutions. She's the former Canadian Minister of Environment and a prominent, prominent global leader in the energy transition. Uh, Climate and Nature Solutions works with governments, not-for-profits, academia, and the private sector to scale practical climate and nature-based solutions. So I'll give the floor to Catherine. She's quite passionate about this whole topic. Um, we could probably get her going for the next two hours, but we have a lineup of other panelists that we need to get to, Catherine. So floor mm -hmm. is yours. Good news. I'm not in politics anymore, so I don't have to do speeches that are five minutes and turn out to be half an hour. Um, <laughs> Well, it's great to to be with uh, to be here with you, Devashish, um, and also Invest Ottawa. Um, you both, uh, well, Blue Wave AI, but also Invest Ottawa, supporting amazing uh, Ottawa companies that are doing transformative things. And we have a bunch of speakers who will also who are also doing great things. But look, I mean, the reality is that uh, we have a huge problem. It's called climate change. 
Um, but we're smart and there are solutions out there, but we haven't been using them in the most intelligent way possible. So what is amazing about Blue Wave AI, and Blue Wave AI has been on my radar for quite a long time, um, and I'll say it's not just a, an Ottawa company, it's not just a Canadian company, it's a global company that's really changing the way things are done in terms of uh, the more efficient um, but smarter grids. Um, and why is that important? Because there's just, we need, uh, first of all, uh, we're not just on renewable energy, a secret that we don't talk about enough in Canada is we're 80% clean in Canada, which is a great story, but we still have a long way to go. And as we electrify everything, we're gonna need uh, more power. We're gonna need more renewable energy on the grid. And when you look globally, most countries are far below uh, our threshold. Um, and so we need to help them transform their grid, um, bring on renewable energy, but we're gonna have to, as the demands increase, we're gonna have to be smarter about the use. So what is great is seeing uh, the connection between moving to cleaner energy while using uh, AI and big data. And that's a space where there's a huge opportunity in terms of being more efficient um, in the use of energy, but also cost savings. And I've always said, I mean, people want to do the right thing, but they also want to save money. And it's great to see. I mean, you're doing uh, a Blue Wave AI is doing great things in a, a variety of spaces. But when we talk about the EV space, that's a massive opportunity. There's certainly the government of Canada is absolutely committed. I'm not part of them, but I will say when I was minister of infrastructure, it was a top priority of mine because when you look at where emissions are, transportation sector is a huge, uh, huge chunk of our emissions. Um, that's not just cars, um, that's trucks, that's buses. I mean, of course we can go into, that's also ships and planes. Um, but if you take uh, both uh, electric, well, you take electric vehicles or take, let's take electric buses. So in good news, remember when Jim Watson and I first talked about electric buses, he's like, I think I'll try one. And I was like, what? <laughs> one, we're gonna do more than one. So then I think we went to four. And then I said, well, what if we had a financing mechanism that could support you? So the Canada Infrastructure Bank is helping to finance uh, Ottawa going to 100% electric buses, as well as supporting municipalities across the country to do that. Why? Because if you are smart with electric buses, uh, moving from diesel to electric while you have higher upfront costs, there's huge savings. Um, but you can be even smarter with those savings and even smarter with the use of energy if you are using proper data, proper analytics, charging at night when there's extra power on the grid. And that's why Blue Wave AI is so critically important because we need to be smart. We do not have time. We need to transform everything right now. Um, and we need to be more efficient in, in terms of how we do how we're doing things. And so we were talking and I don't know whether uh, Devashish, you'll talk about this or someone else will talk about it. But the fact that, you know, it's good to have electric buses, it's better to use them. <laughs> and so, you know, figuring out what the you know, how you can use them. Um, they're often concerns about being able to charge um, and how long the charge will be and actually the, the power. Uh, whether you have enough power in your grid, this is something that Blue Wave AI is really transforming and providing real solutions. So that is it. That's my um, uh, just my my huge pitch for what Blue Wave AI is doing um, to its partners and and also to Invest Ottawa. And I will say, you're still seeing me in Ottawa. Uh, I'm in my house. Uh, I'm a. I will always be uh, a huge, uh, huge fan of Ottawa companies that are transforming uh, the way we do things here in Canada, but around the world. Um, it's great for jobs. Uh, it's great for the economy, but it's also great to showcase uh, how Canada really at its best. So huge congrats, uh, Devashish, to your team, uh, to Invest Ottawa and all the folks here. Thanks, Catherine. And you know, inside our team, we basically say, look, if we can make you know, 100 buses virtually equal to 130 buses, just by using the data smarter, your CapEx is lower and you have the same diesel offset in the, uh, on the road. Or you get more diesel offset off the road with buying 130 buses because then they behave like 169 buses. So um, using the data, I can't say like how important it is uh, you know, we've toured various transit depots, you know, and you go there at like two in the afternoon and all the electric buses are parked there with not in service because 
they've used up their charge and they're getting charged up and you know how how to charge things better at the right time. So with that, I'm going to introduce our panelists. Now, these people are on the floor in the real world trying to enable this uh, energy transition. So our panelists are Alan Weston Stow, Director of Business Development at Proterra Buses, uh, Bronwyn Lazowski, Policy Analyst at Natural Resources Canada, Jim Herring, the Chief Information Officer of MV Transportation, Tegan Tully, Managing Director of one of Canada's premier newly spun out fleet electrification companies, Power On, Kelly Dace, Director of Strategic Markets at Invest Ottawa and at Area Exo, and Laurie Huff, Director of uh, Distribution Operations at, uh, at Hydro Ottawa. I'm going to now pass the floor over to them sequentially in alphabetical order by first name uh, to, so they can tell you a bit more about their company and the challenges they're facing. So the first person on deck is, is Alan. Um, Alan, I don't know if you're in the London subway or if you're uh, actually, it, it doesn't look like you're in a subway. So go ahead, Alan, tell us a bit about Proterra. Right, thank you. Uh, my name is Alan Westenskow. I'm the Director of Business Development of Proterra. And uh, we do really three things. One, we've been, uh, we're the leading manufacturers of battery electric buses in North America for the last 12 years. So I started delivering electric buses in North America 12 years ago and uh, 25 million miles to date. So uh, we build buses ground from the ground up, but we also uh, make the batteries that go on those buses. And those batteries are now being used by 15 other manufacturers from delivery vehicles to school buses to um, cranes at ports. So uh, we're in the battery business as well. We also have an energy uh, charging solutions team that helps figure out how to install and use the best charging infrastructure and uh, do it in the smart way that everybody's been talking about to help lower the costs and get the best overall solution. Thank you. Okay, next up is uh, Bronwyn Lazowski from Natural Resources Canada. So she must find this like really exciting being in a panel with all these people who are implementing the stuff that they're trying to create programs for in Natural Resources Canada. Go ahead, Bronwyn. Great, thanks for the warm welcome, Dev. It's great to be here. Um, and like Dev said, I work at Natural Resources Canada and I lead the initiative on innovation and electricity regulation. And particularly I'm in the Office of Energy Research and Development. So as you can imagine, we are committed to delivering policies and programs related to research, demonstration and development of innovative technologies and business models that help support grid readiness for this electrified transportation transmission. Thanks, Dev. Okay, thanks, Bronwyn. Uh, next up, Jim Herring, Chief Information Officer at MV Transport tra Transportation. Hey, thanks, Dev. Uh, appreciate the intro and the warm welcome. Uh, MV Transportation, we are the largest uh, privately owned transportation operator in the United States. Uh, found, founded in 1975, we are family owned. We provide uh, paratransit, fixed route, public and private shuttle, and some student transportation services. I guess for this conversation, uh, and especially in paratransit, every 24 hours, we have to make this real on the street for people who ride our services because they have to. Uh, they're not choice riders. So to your point, that's what we do every 24 hours. We run a live operation on the street and we transport about 110 million passengers per, uh, per year. So Jim, how many, uh, how many uh, uh, cities in North America does MV service? Just right, around, right around 200, um, and then a little bit of private, another 40 or 50 that are private. Now that's a great achievement by your team at MV. Congratulations on Thank that. Thank you. Uh, next up, his company hasn't been around since 1975. Uh, more like 2021. So Keegan Tully, over to you. Thanks, Dev. Um, you know, we, you, you talked about our new newness. We're uh, Power on Energy Solutions, and we're a wholly owned subsidiary of Ontario Power Generation, which is a large power generator in, here in Ontario. Uh, and so Power On was really set up to, to work with fleets to support them in their sort of electrification journey. Uh, so we design, build, operate, maintain uh, charging infrastructure and other electrical infrastructure to support fleets. And really the goal is to help uh, fleets simplify 
uh, the process of going electric, reduce the costs, you know, and transfer the risk. It, it's a new thing for a lot of fleets, and you know, it, it's right up our alley as operators of electrical infrastructure. So that's really what we're we're doing here at Power On. So, uh, Keegan, basically, the fleet guys come to you, and they can close their eyes, and they just say, "Power On," just figure out when the buses get charged and when they hit the road, and you guys take care of it. Um, so. Uh, Bronwyn, you all are set, setting the policy. If you want to see the, the, the steel-toed boots on the ground and literally the power on guys have to be, you know, in the depot uh, uh, clothed that way, here's the man who's running that show. Okay, next over. Um, none of this works without the right type of infrastructure and uh, communications and tech in our cities, ideally smart cities. So with that, Kelly Days from Invest Ottawa and AreaXO. Yeah, thanks, Dev. So um, I'm one of the founders of AreaX.O, which is operated by Invest Ottawa. We're really focused on accelerating um, and deploying commercialization of, of Canadian-based companies, often very complex smart city solutions. So we have an infrastructure, a very advanced communication infrastructure, so everything from 5G uh, to LoRa to TV white space to GPS and even satellite backhaul. And so we're able to um, utilize our private test track to uh, create environments to test and validate solutions before they're deployed in the real world. So we can bring the regulators, the policymakers, a, a group of partner companies together, modify our infrastructure, deploy a test, um, you know, take the highest risk situations um, from real world deployments and test them in a closed private setting. And I think that really gives, you know, um, we're all risk adverse. Um, we, we need to make sure that when we deploy these things, they'll work, they'll work properly, and then understand um, how they'll react in different situations. So we're really excited to be here today. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of the panel. Kelly, could you just touch on your, uh, uh, um, your, your uh, uh, autonomous vehicle test track at Air Area XO? Because eventually there will be taxis and buses and all kinds of transportation that's electrified and also partially or fully autonomous, right? Yeah, I would I would say we may have the most advanced autonomous R&D vehicle at our site um, for companies to use. So we're 100% um, focused on the entire smart mobility, smart city solution. I think um, Deb, that's really the uniqueness of the site. You said earlier in your opening remarks, no one's going to do this in um, their own little bubble, right? The solutions are multi-vendor, multi-interruptibility. And that's really what we've created at the private test track. It's 1,866 acres, it's federal government land. Um, the assets and the infrastructure, you know, whether it's our shuttles, we, we have two autonomous shuttles there. We have motorized test dummies. Um, we have all kinds of machine vision sensors, all the infrastructure, the private test track has been actually deployed by city of Ottawa. So the three-way traffic lights, four-way traffic lights, at grade level rail crossing, everything fiber backhauled to our command center. So then the types of use cases we can do at the site um, prior to real world deployments, I think is, is second to none. And, and again, really excited to be here today with these amazing companies and, and help Canada really um, lead in, in the smart city innovation file. So thanks so much. That's really cool. Thank you, Kelly. I I still say uh, at some point I want to be able to rent the whole test track to run a bicycle race with uh, my buddies, but uh, I, I guess that doesn't qualify. Um, so batting cleanup here is Lori Huff from Hydro Ottawa. So all of us go do all this crazy stuff and guess what? Someone's got to operate the grid and absorb all of this. And that's why we have Lori here because she's at the tail end of all of us doing this cool stuff. and suddenly, you know, someone calls up Lori and says, you know, uh, there's going to be this last mile delivery company that needs like a 10 megawatt grid connection. And she's like, what? They never talk to us. So Lori, over to you. Thanks, Deb. And honestly, the, when you guys do cool stuff, that means we get to do cool stuff. So as I think most people know, the electricity world hasn't changed or electricity delivery stuff hasn't changed in the last hundred years. So it's kind of fun to see all this new stuff coming down and creates new challenges and new stuff for us to work on. So um, so Hydro Ottawa is the local distribution company or the primary local distribution company within the city of Ottawa, so Canada's capital region. Uh, Hydro Ottawa is definitely a very committed company towards green energy and towards a sustainable future. Uh, we recently made a, um, an announcement that we are striving to be net zero by 2030. 
Um, and also were recently awarded the Sustainable Electricity Company designation by um, the Canadian Electricity Association and Electricity Canada. Now they've rebranded themselves. So uh, we're very committed to being the first choice for green energy kind of products and uh, partnerships within the city of Ottawa and very much looking forward to these changes coming. Um, EVs uh, in general aren't new to Hydro Ottawa. We've been um, exploring this space for probably about a decade now. We've been working with NRCAN and other um, other research areas within the city of Ottawa to start preparing for the eventual adoption of EVs. We were one of the first utilities if, um, in Ontario to actually change our standard within the residential area to um, allow for uh, larger transformers, larger wire sizes to prepare for um, EVs. We've been doing that for the last couple of years now. Um, and now it's uh, we're starting to get people knocking on our door. So things are actually happening and um, now's the fun time. So we've been preparing for it for a while and um, hopefully we're uh, as ready as we can be. But of course, there are challenges that even now are just popping up that we're looking forward to tackling and finding solutions for our customers. Thanks. Thanks, Lori. So with that, let's um, start the actual roundtable fireside chat discussion. Uh, the first question we have are uh, the broad trends that you all see in both personal and fleet electrification. Snapshot today, fast forward two years and five years. I'm gonna start off with uh, Alan Westenskow from Proterra because um, as a uh, commercially driven company, obviously they wanna see a big upside in five years. And uh, we're at one point here in the industry today. So Alan, um, you guys sell electric buses all over the world. Um, what do you see now, two years from now, five years from now, um, on the fleet side of things? A great question. So um, I think what's happening right now is we're going from pilot phase to full fleet adoption. And I think we see that with the goals that we've seen transit agencies all throughout the United States make. And um, in, in Canada, I should say, I'm sorry, all of North America. Uh, and Canada, even more aggressive in many ways. But um, uh, so we see people do pilot fleets where there's, you know, five to 10 buses, as was kind of mentioned uh, early on in the conversation here. And uh, we're seeing now um, where we have fleets that are going to be in the hundreds. I would, I would call it the moment of lift, right? We're getting ready to be in that airplane and it's going to take off the tarmac and it's not coming down. And uh, one thing that's fun, you know, when I started doing this seven years ago, you had to convince people that a battery electric was going to be a thing. And nobody questions that anymore. Everybody recognizes this is the future. Uh, all the manufacturers run on it, and it's just scaling up. So it's going to be uh, a lot uh, to do. And, and finding the charging infrastructure, I think, is going to be one of the gating items. But we've got a lot of smart people who are going to figure that out um, and uh, be able to, to scale up. And the technology is there. It's mature. Um, the most mature of the new technology for zero emissions. So uh, that's how we see it. And we're just scaling up and getting ready to go and, and see those things happen. Uh, Bronwyn from Natural Resources Canada from a overall policy and government perspectives. You guys, you have people like um, uh, Alan selling the buses. Um, you all have to start preparing uh, a whole bunch of things at regulatory and government levels and programs and funding. What, what, are, what are your thoughts on what's going on in your department to, to get ready for all of this? Definitely. Well, um, as mentioned, it's definitely in that liftoff stage and that takeoff stage for sure. And as you are probably all well aware, um, within the most recent weeks, there was the announcement of the emissions reductions plan, as well as the most recent announcement of the budget. And in there embedding um, the commitment on the Canadian government's perspective on sales targets uh, for you know, the near term to medium term in both light duty vehicles, as well as MHDVs, where you know MHDVs play a huge part in our emissions reductions, contributing to 9% of Canada's total emissions. So we have a large scale commitment of seeing those sales targets increase um, with 20% in 2026 to 100% in 2035 for light duty vehicles alone. So as you can imagine that charging infrastructure and the grid readiness has to be there to meet those needs and um, having those data and AI components in the space of innovation are incredibly important so we can maintain the safety and the reliability of our electricity system so we can ultimately keep the lights on while we also deliver these neat and cool service offerings that these ZEVs can provide. 
Hey, Bronwyn, um, as we have uh, several international viewers, uh, you mentioned the budget. They wouldn't know, our international viewers wouldn't know the context of the budget. Could, could, could you just give a snapshot from your government, from your department's angle? Exactly. So for those of you who don't know, the budget basically identifies the activities that will be taking place throughout the course of the financial year um, and into the near future as well. So a key cornerstone of that budget identifies, you know, the activities that we can um, put forward. A key pillar of that, as identified, um, was the emissions reduction plan and the activities associated with that, with ZEVs having a key component to it. Um, key uh, areas of investment, as identified last week, were in both the charging infrastructure component, as well as in the adoption of ZEVs as well. So uh, twofold um, in terms of future activities and uh, future milestones that uh, the country will be advancing in. Okay, thank you. And Lori, from a uh, grid operation side, zero years from now, two years from now, five years from now, in your department operations and planning, what, what are the types of discussions that, uh, that you're having, both on, uh, with respect to the, the point loads of the fleet, as well as the distributed loads from all of our EVs? I got to put my order in, by the way, and ride my bike less, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, so I'd say in general, it's it's really the two and five years we're planning for now. So most of the loads that we're going to see that are coming on that are bigger loads are coming. We we have to start getting ready for them now. Um, so as uh, Catherine McKenna had alluded to um, at the beginning um, in her opening remarks, uh, the city of Ottawa has uh, made a commitment to go to 100% electric buses. And so we are working closely with them and through our sister company uh, in Vari to identify how we're going to be able to provide them with the electric load um, that they are that they do require, and um, it's not it's not an insignificant load. Let's say that it's probably actually one of the largest loads that or load requests that we've seen um, in the city, if not the largest load request we've ever seen in the city coming in from from the city in order to uh, actually solve the load requirements for the buses. So um, it's really a matter of us starting to work more collaboratively collaboratively with our customers and understanding not only how can we supply them with the power and the demand that they're requiring, but also how can we um, work with them to understand alternative ways, whether it be time shifting for their load or um, like as you had alluded to previously, the battery management. Um, and so it becomes more of an ecosystem, I think, where we're working with, um, not it's not just the customer, the end user and the utility anymore to create the connection. You also have to work in concert with folks like yourself at Blue Wave and also bringing in the bus manufacturers and a lot of the folks on the call, like they become integral in order for us to actually solve this, um, this issue because I think it's critically important. We enable the buses onto the road and we enable the electrification of the transportation and enable the EVs. Um, and it may not be just as simple as kind of plugging them in um, the traditional way. And so we do need to start thinking creatively and working collaboratively in order to find a way to make that happen as quickly as possible. So. Thanks, Lori. Hey, um, Jim, I didn't originally, uh, Jim from MV Transportation, I didn't really, uh, I didn't originally have you on deck on, on this particular topic, but with 200 cities that you deal with, um, what are you, uh, you know, on, with the breadth of your customers, what are the general trends that you're seeing with the electrification and the challenges that the MV team is getting ready for? I know you get asked to, you know, help uh, uh, cities with, uh, you know, feasibility and then operations of, uh, of, uh, of, of these mixed fleets. If you could take the floor and just kind of share your thoughts, Jim. Yeah, both private and public both. And, and we think probably in terms of a decade long plan. So especially in the state of California, um, there's stated desires to be uh, zero emissions by 2030, 2035. If you look at some of the federal subsidies that have come out just in the last several months, uh, many, of those, many of those agencies actually have to submit a plan. They call it an ICT plan. So we're really involved in thinking probably differently over that. You know, I joke with you before, like my favorite thing is when I get called to say, hey, I bought a bus, now what do I do? Um, but to your point, the really question is, what are we going to do over the next decade? Because too much of the bus buying happening up front without the infrastructure planning, without the operations planning. And I'll talk a little bit later about business continuity and guaranteed rides. And that becomes really, really important for our customers. Um, 
lot, you know, there's some of our private, some of the school bus may be choice riders, but a lot of people depend on us for essential services and essential needs. So really planning that over that entire course of time, I have to think about, as two points, we get the scale of 10, 20 buses, okay, but I got 50% of the fleet that will start to be zero emission or battery electric. At some point in time, I have to provide ride certainty and I have to do that every hour of every day. And that becomes really, really important. So I think for the first time ever, we've probably planned transportation before in one, two and three year cycles now, but I think it's now a decade long planning cycle with most of our transit agencies, which I think several of the other speakers spoke about. There's a funding element of that as well as uh, the continuity of service element. So that's what we're working with. Uh, I would say California and the state of Washington are sort of the lead in some of those, starting to see it in New York and a little bit in Illinois. Um, but yeah, that's, I, I would say we're, we're starting, we have a little bit of consulting service. We partnered with you on some of those to say, boy, what will we do in five years? And, and I think that's really important. Okay, fantastic, Jim, really appreciate it. So in terms of the uh, infrastructure needed for the, grid and fleet operations to on, onboard EV. I'm gonna go around the table and ask some of you guys and girls what uh, what you think are some of the big challenges. Um, I'm gonna start with Alan from Proterra um, because they, uh, they are dependent on the infrastructure from the grid, communications, charging infrastructure and so forth. What, uh, what, what are your thoughts, Alan? What are you seeing across your customer base? And, and maybe tie in, you know, the, the two bus version of infrastructure and the 200 bus version of infrastructure. Yeah, so number one, I think it's just, you know, uh, getting the equipment and making it to be able to interconnect and coordinate to be able to do what it needs to do on large fleets. You know, we haven't seen a lot of really large fleets. We've seen some medium sized fleets, but uh, just give people confidence that can work. But I, I also think being able to show that it can actually scale. I think there's uh, some questions in the narrative right now about whether or not uh, charging at fleet scale can work from a cost per mile basis. And we're doing some analysis that I think will show that it does scale. And from a dollar per bus cost, it, it isn't any worse than it is for a hundred, it is for one. Um, but I think people have been a bit afraid of that. Uh, and that, that works partly because of the technology that uh, you all and others are providing that allows for uh, optimization of uh, fleet charging with charge management, energy management. And uh, when we can be able to use a single 150, 180 kilowatt charger to charge four buses, you know, four dispensers on that, then we can actually start pulling those costs down. Because, you know, for companies like MV, that's important. At the end of the day, they've got to win contracts. And to do that, uh, we've got to be able to show how we can actually keep that charging infrastructure down. Sometimes that's a, something that people don't think about. They just think about the bus and they think that charging is going to happen. And then, uh, then it doesn't. It's got to be reliable and, and make sure that things work, uh, and also keep the electricity cost down. Everything else being equal, it should work. You know, the economics are there. To be able to have savings from your diesel or CNG or whatever else you may be using to be offset by the lower uh, electric costs. Um, but we've got to be able to make that work with uh, being able to do that 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 larger scale fleet charging. And I think the technology is there. We just need to be able to demonstrate it. Cool. Um, actually, Keegan Tully from Power On, I'm going to pull you in to amplify on this topic because on the other end of it, uh, uh, you're operating a deployment, I think, uh, where there's Proterra buses, among others, um, but you're going through the whole, the whole transition from a few to a lot to a gigantic amount. And... Um, you're going to have to operate all of this infrastructure, charging, battery, natural gas backups, grid connections, solar. You're, you're going to have everything. You're going to operate in microgrids with a high penetration fleet. So what are the types of things that Power On is doing to, to basically enable not just the onboarding of the buses, but the parallel infrastructure uh, uh, onboarding and operation? Yeah, I mean... I think it's a, a, a challenge, but it's a, a, a challenge that we're able to, to tackle. And I think Lori was sort of alluding to it before, you know, these are big connections and um, it's really important to, to get planning early and, and, and work with the utilities like Hydro Ottawa uh, to, to, to get planning and get that infrastructure rolled out quickly. And, you know, as we see 
deeper electrification. And I, I think Jim was uh, alluding to it before, you know, a lot of these transit operators and other fleets are operating essential services. And so it's more than just chargers, uh, it, it's backup generation. Uh, you know, people are looking to decarbonize, maybe they're adding solar PV, uh, stationary battery storage. And all of these assets are incredibly, incredibly valued that, you know, they're costly but they, they have a lot of value to the electricity grid. So we, we really work with our, our customers to, to plan out their, their fleet electrification needs, think of through the charging infrastructure that they're gonna need and, and then the other electrical assets. And then we look at opportunities to really, uh, you know, uh, plan it out and, and maximize the value of those assets. Cause they, when they're not in use for backup at, at the fleet, they can be used for the grid and, and things like that and provide services there. So we really look at all those opportunities to lower the cost of electrification and, and really simplify it for, for fleets and help them make that transition a, a bit easier. Thanks. Thanks, Keegan. That's, uh, that's really helpful. So building on that, um, Laurie from Hydro Ottawa, what um, on the grid side, what type of infrastructure do you see that you guys have to get involved with between larger grid connections, in front of meter battery storage, working with partners to maybe maybe um, install uh, behind the meter battery storage to enable fleets. Uh, on the residential EV penetration side on constrained loops, what, what are the challenges that you all are facing? All of those things. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so tell us more. I'm just talking about them. You know all about them. <laughs> yeah. So uh, on the residential side, that's definitely one. And we have been working with, as you know, Blue Wave AI to, to model that out and to get an understanding. And our preliminary data that we're looking at is showing that it probably doesn't take much more than 25% penetration on some of our loops, depending on the way that the, um, the, the way that that uh, residential uh, neighborhood was constructed and the age of the equipment that we could actually start seeing some overloading on the local transformers and some potential issues in that space. And so there is, that is definitely a concern of ours and it is something that we're actively looking to understand. And um, we're um, looking to see what types of creative solutions we can come up with, as you noted, uh, maybe front of the meter batteries where we could provide some additional support in that space. Um, there's also the um, ever um, outstanding question around the control of the EV chargers or of the actual um, the vehicles themselves within uh, our customers' homes and um, helping to shift load away from those peak times. Uh, we, from our modeling, what we are seeing on the EV or on the residential side, sorry, specifically is that kind of time when people come home from work and they want to charge their car, but they also want to turn on the oven. They also want to do a load of laundry. They also want to do all kinds of turn on their Xbox for their kids or whatever it may be. And so that's kind of the time of day that uh, has us the most concerned, I would say, because it is a time where there's uh, peaking on our uh, system. And so if we can shift those loads away and um, in any way create a fashion or else otherwise support the grid at that time, that's obviously beneficial. Um, and on the uh, on the more fleet side, uh, it is there, it, it depends on where you are in the city, right? So there's some areas where we have more than enough capacity and we can connect the additional load and provide that additional load to our customers quite easily. And then there's other areas where um, we may actually require transmission upgrades. So it may be not only just our local distribution infrastructure that needs to be upgraded, but we may also have to look to upgrade transmission infrastructure because um, as all these loads are coming on to the system at the same time throughout the province, it's also putting stress and strain on our transmission system too. So um, really, I just can't stress enough how important it is for customers to get in with us up front and to start working with, um, with an affiliate of ours like in Bari or um, as Keegan also has, which is power on like to those types of customers where they can, or those types of companies who can help support and kind of bridge that knowledge gap between that customer and the local distribution company. Okay, thanks. Um... You know, let, let's take it up a level. Uh, uh, Lori mentioned, you know, the challenges on the transmission side. There's, there's, there's a generation side, the transmission side, the distribution side, all who have to deal with more energy uh, being delivered through the grid to uh, electric vehicles. So Bronwyn, at, a, at, at kind of a national and, and policy level, what, what are some of the programs that are kicking in to basically enable that? Because you know, arguably, 
um, you know, if enough energy has to move to electric vehicles through the wires, it has to come from somewhere. It has to go through wires and it has to get to depots or to our homes. Um, what are the types of things that you all are, 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 are uh, enabling the overall energy industry with at a, at a government um, uh, planning level, I guess? Yeah, great. So um, basically, there's lots of uh, programs that we have in implementation. Some are newer than others, as you can imagine, because of the recent budget announcement just this past week. Uh, but essentially, uh, within our role in the Office of Energy Research and Development, as I mentioned in my introduction, we're focused on the innovation stage of technologies um, in that innovation stage. So we're really trying to identify, you know, those technologies those service uh, uh, models, as well as those other opportunities that can help uh, to enable those future technologies that are needed for, you know, the future state of uh, the electricity grid, as well as um, our, our energy system as well. Um, and if you look at it from more of a deployment side of things, um, we do have some active programming um, that was released in the previous budget um, and has been uh, reallocated as well. So our Smart Renewables Electrification Pathways Program is one of uh, those particular programs that is looking at how can we meet uh, the decarbonized energy system needs um, and looking at it from um, adding in grid modernization components. So um, it's not just solar panels, but solar panels with advanced inverter functions, as well as the ability to have storage and other key components within um, the uh, renewable energy systems that are um, implemented as part of that large scale infrastructure program. Um, but like I mentioned as well, um, more recently as part of uh, the most uh, recent announcement in the budget, there will be programs coming forward uh, to support the charging infrastructure as well as the adoption of uh, ZEVs as well. So stay tuned for those um, as those have been mentioned in, in the news more recently. Um, but like I said, we're really involved in that innovation space and scaling up so that we can meet uh, the solutions of tomorrow. Uh, Bronwyn just mentioned, you know, some, some, some of that infrastructure and innovation. Actually, that uh, I should pull you in, Kelly. Um, because the, the type of stuff that you all are doing at Area XO actually plays into enabling um, this kind of transition and you know more fueling of, uh, of vehicles coming through the grid, uh, as well as like communication and other infrastructure for fleets. So would you like to amplify a bit from the Area XO perspective? Yeah, absolutely, Dev. I've been taking lots of notes as people are talking because I think this is a perfect example of how we can all work together to do a, you know, a demonstration infrastructure platform that will enable what everyone is trying to do, but to be able to do it in a safe way and in a closed, uh, in a closed fashion. The private test track in particular, it's like I said, almost 2000 acres. So there's kilometers and kilometers of roadway and we have a lot of infrastructure there already. So safety and security is our starting point for everything that we do at Ariax.io. And we've created a framework, as I said, that you start private and you move to public. We have level two and level three chargers that are installed. We worked with Hydro Ottawa when we were installing those in Envari to ensure they're scalable and they can ramp up. They're ready for modification. They're ready to do some of this work. Um, the roadways, the pathways, the other areas that we have, you know, areas of, of you know, smart charging, so inductive charging, um, you know, we have a platform where you could start with you know, electric vehicles, but those electric vehicles are going to get smarter and smarter. And, and that's another area that we play in. So, you know, a, a lot of the work you're doing at Blue Wave Dev um, in the grid and the AI and the cloud, um, you know, imagine if the vehicles are, are charging, you know, they, they plug into the charging stations or inductive charging, they know it's Dev, they know it's that vehicle, they know it's safe and secure. There's a, you know, encrypted handshake. Um, they know your battery is the battery is is safe to charge right? and another big issue as we roll out these technologies and residentials and parking brocades and other areas is it a safe battery to charge and then they know dev to send the, that to your bill on hydro ottawa right there's dev charged here <laughs> ching <laughs> we'll just send that's that great. over and that's really i think where um the aspiration is to to create that that demonstration and platform for everyone to come together and and showcase use ensure it's secure and then to continue to, to build on it and modify. So I'd welcome um, whoever's interested in this project. Um, we have a great infrastructure, communication infrastructure, cloud environment, or you can bring your own. So um, yeah, I think it was, it's been really um, enlightening today and I'd welcome um, everyone to come talk to us and, uh, and let's see what we can do together.
Okay, I'm going to switch gears here a bit, and um, I'm going to focus a bit on the um, the energy side. When we talk with uh, operators of fleets, many of them haven't onboarded electric vehicles yet. And as soon as they start getting into some of the research on what it's going to take, they quickly realize it's actually a fairly complex um, operational problem coupled with energy management problem, trying to maximize electric miles, trying to minimize your cost of electricity, get diesel off the road, put electric buses on the road. And the traditional fleet operator, he has a schedule, the buses or the delivery vehicles line up, the gas gets poured and away they go. And then suddenly, what do you mean I need four, six, eight hours to take my electric bus out of service? I'm just gonna put a diesel bus on the road. Forget about those electric buses, just park them in the corner. They're too hard to deal with. Someone help me um, because I run, and, and, and typically in the operation, you got two accounting budgets. You got like the fuel and operations budget, and then you got the depot budget. The depot guy has the electricity budget, and the operations guy moving the fleet around has the diesel budget. And then suddenly these two worlds come together. And uh, I think your customers, uh, Keegan, are looking to the likes of power on to say, okay, you know what, Keegan, just I don't want to have to think about this operate the energy, deliver me buses on the road, minimize my cost of electricity, um, share, share with the audience some of the, some of the banter with, with your customers when they realize kind of in quotes how difficult this is from a, from a transformation of business processes and operational angle. And the fact that they don't have 20 years of experience doing this, so they have to quickly transform. So over to you, Keegan. Yeah, thanks, Dan. You know, I, I think it, it it starts from this where we're at in the <clears throat> the stage of fleet of electrification. We've heard it a couple of times. We're at that liftoff stage, moving from pilot into you know deep electrification, and it gets more complicated as as you you go there. You know, utilities have a language that they speak and um, and timelines that they they adhere to, and there's just a culture. And so I think that can be a bit daunting for fleets. You know, they think they can just go plug in and um, it, it takes a little bit more than that. And so we really work with fleets and, and offer things like charging as a service to, to simplify that process. So, you know, we come from the utility world. So we understand what needs to be done from that perspective and we can sort of bridge the gap. Um, I, I, we don't want fleets to get sort of daunted by this. And so the, the goal is really to, to take a lot of that work and, and do these turnkey deployments for fleets. Um, we can finance things, you know, offer charging as a service to because to, the infrastructure can be expensive and uh, requires a lot of upfront investment. So we can help, help finance that and, and minimize the upfront costs. And then I think risk transfer is important too. You know, people are used to relying on diesel. Uh, they have it on site. Uh, and, and it's there and available for them when they need it. Electricity is a, a different beast. There's chargers to maintain. Um, you know, there's the, the grid and what will it be there when you need to charge? And then how do you really optimize your, your costs as you were alluding to, Dev? You know, how do we make sure we're consuming and not, not driving too much peak consumption that, that drives up the cost of electricity? And, and we really work with our fleets to... to to manage all of that and, and really reduce the cost so that it's a more reliable and, and cheaper solution for them. Hey, Keegan, uh, um, maybe share with the audience something like really simple, like, so when the operator, you know, hooks up the traditional bus to fuel with diesel, it's kind of apparent what's going on. Now, you roll up this electric bus and it's like black magic, whether en energy is going in or not. The charger may or may not even be operational the whole time the, it's hooked up. So in terms of like backup and failover and resiliency, what are some of the, you know, the, uh, the fleet operators, what, what are they telling you about, you know, like, I just want this to hit the road, but 
tell me where to go to if you know what lane do I put this bus in? What, what what's some of the banter you hear on the on the ground? Yeah, I mean, when you have diesel, all the buses are the same, right? Generally, if you have the same thing, you know, usually your diesel bus can do all of your routes. And many transit agencies have large grids of vehicles that are stacked up in a row. So you might have like 20 lanes of 10 vehicles deep. Now, once you get into electrification, you're going to have different vintages. So the buses that you bought in 2022, the ones you bought in 2025, and there's going to be degradation of the battery. The technology is changing as we speak. So the buses will have different size batteries, different uh, leftover capacity in that, 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 uh, that battery. So you really have to be smart about how you uh, uh, plan out what route that bus is going to take. Does it have enough range? What is the consumption going to be on that route? And then start assigning buses to parking lots. You might even have different charger powers. You know, you might have a yeah. pantograph at one. You might have a plug-in charger with different speeds. So it becomes a very complex optimize, uh, optimization problem. And, and that's why we, we look to people like you, Dev, and, yeah. and the, the AI and, and, and data analytics to really start thinking through as we get to this deep electrification, how are we going to really optimize this? It becomes too challenging for, for a human and, and we need AI and, and machine learning type solutions to, to really to really optimize what we're, we're doing with the fleet and maximize the electric miles on, on the road. Great. I'll flip it over to Jim. So Jim, you're in 200 cities. There's 200 mayors in 200 cities <laughs> and uh, there's a state governor and, and a president on top of those guys. And the, the mayor stands up and declares he's going 100% electric like Lori's mayor just recently did in, in, in Ottawa, I guess. And then, um, you know, some poor guy running the, the depot operations is on the receiving end of making it all work. He, he, go, he calls up Jim and says, Jim, uh, help us with this. So then what do you do to, enable that guy has no idea energy as a service electric miles, diesel miles, whatever. What, what, what are you seeing from the US market? Yeah, let me share a couple of things with that, um, Dev. And I don't know if we've shared with you, but it's just been announced. So our, our nation's first fully battery electric fleet will be the Antelope Valley Transit Authority in the high desert of California. Uh, they accomplished that in March and we will be their partner beginning July 1st. So that's gonna be real, uh, just a little bit underneath a hundred buses. And so a little bit on the infrastructure and to your point to frame that problem that Keegan and, and you did a really good job. Facility and site planning today as an operator, you can just change facilities. Your question is, hey, where can I park on my vehicles? But in the future, you're going to build infrastructure for the next decade. So no longer will you transfer facilities, but space planning is just as important as anything else. It's parking, but it's access. It's the wiring and everything that goes in it. Once you do, in fact, build that you're not gonna change that facility very long. So space planning becomes a big deal to your point. Every day at the end of the day today, we go to a service island, you wash a bus, you fuel it, you put it in a parking spot. Today though, the logistics of that and, and which bus gets parked where, right? For the next day's route becomes super, super, super important. So to your point, when you, you asked about infrastructure and I didn't comment on that, but I, we're an and when it comes to infrastructure, yes. Microgrids, onsite, solar, vehicle to grid, we need it all because I have to plan for the worst case scenario to your earlier point. What do I do if there's a rolling brownout in California? I don't get to say, I mean, you never do that today. We never say hey, we're, we're out of gasoline or diesel today. Yeah. I won't be able to do that in the future. Right? And, so and I, maybe if I can interrupt you, when there's five electric uh, buses on the ground, your backup is just send a diesel that's right. bus out. That's right. But but but, but when there's a hundred out of a hundred, your backup isn't sending another, another diesel bus out there. That's right. So in this particular case, we have on route changing, on site storage. Um, I mean, all of those things with it. So, and he talked about the shifting of risk. I mean, for sure, we're going to want continuity of service. So I don't want to become an electric company. I don't want to become a grid operator. I just want to make sure I can plan a route with operators and vehicles. So the way I maintain them, I think energy as a service, charging as a service. Uh, and you mentioned the OEMs earlier, Dev, the work with you. I need instant real-time telemetry on every part of my infrastructure going forward, every vehicle where it's at that I day. see Kelly nodding in the background. Yes, and she, <laughs> she wants to sell. Yeah, she wants to get, yes, I need all that. And today, what do you need? I need a fuel gauge and operator to just tell me if something went wrong. 
but 24 by seven, minute by minute, I need instant visibility to every vehicle, the state of every charging facility across the entire operation. So I think energy as a service, managed charging as a service, all of those, we are gonna become highly dependent on those. There's some questions on, uh... Uh, in the background from the audience about uh, key analytics in terms of looking at the efficiency of fleet operations and so on. Unfortunately, a uh, gentleman named Sarang, uh, we're, we're wrapping up right now, um, but feel free, there's a, uh, you can outreach to myself directly. I, I can forward it to, to, to some of the panelists. Um, I'd like to take the last few minutes just, just to kind of wrap it up. Um, perhaps we've shared with you in the audience some of the challenges on the ground with electrification of transportation. Um, what this actually presents is a massive opportunity for the global energy transition, which is kind of why we had Catherine Mac McKenna come and kick this whole thing off for us. Alan Westenskow basically said, you know, a few years ago, it was like, you know, what type of zero emission vehicles are going to have legs? And now it's not a question about, you know, some of his electric buses. Um, a few years ago, Lori, her uh, manager and I met and we discussed onboarding of electric vehicles in the grid. Um, I was in, uh, in Berlin meeting with uh, Lori's counterpart there, I guess, at Stromnetz Berlin back in 2019. And they, they weren't worried about you know, electric vehicles in the grid and the load on the grid back in 2019. It was kind of like a future thing. And now here we are sitting in 2022, we're coming out of the pandemic. And yes, I suppose uh, people are driving a bit less than when they used to drive to work, uh, but economic activity all around is picking up. Uh, Bronwyn referred to the Canadian government budget and the, the efforts being made for onboarding of uh, electric vehicles in, in, in our national economy. The German government has made similar announcements uh, recently. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a worldwide trend. Companies like Keegan's have been formed to exclusively deal with uh, fleet electrification. So sitting behind Keegan is Ontario Power Generation, one of the biggest uh, uh, generation utilities in, in, in the Canadian market. I, I don't know how many uh, terawatt hours of energy they, they turn over annually, Keegan, uh, but they created, a, they created an entity just to deal with this whole energy as a service and fleet electrification. Um, and it's not going to be slam dunk like, uh, like uh, Jim from MB Transportation mentioned. It's going to take a, it's going to take a while to get all of this going, deploy the infrastructure, and then manage it and operate it. So we feel at Blue Wave this presents a, a massive opportunity uh, for decarbonization using data better, using AI-driven techniques better, to basically make small gains 24-7. So if you think about every five minutes, Every five minute block, there's about half a million five minute blocks a year. And there's not gonna be an operator standing around pressing buttons, trying to figure out what to do. There's not gonna be an operator sitting around in the back office of the grid, figuring out you know, what energy needs to happen in what part of the grid. All of this is gonna to need to be automated. And that's kind of what we're here for from, from the Blue Wave side. We really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this global transition. And, uh, you know, obviously we had a lot of presenters here from the Canadian market, but we believe that uh, these smart people are on the front end of what's happening worldwide. We're creating the key policies, key technologies, key infrastructure and solutions to do it here, but also take it global. So with that, I'd like to thank you and we look forward to the next one and our marketing team will all be in touch with you to uh, to let you know when our next summit is. Thank you.